Hello, this is Amy Brown, Director of Events and Education for Trade Press Media Group. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Equipment and Technology for Workplace Disinfectants. Our presenters today include Tony Hobson, Mary Torito, Matthew Borkowski. Anthony Hobson joined Open Works in January 2011 and brings over 15 years of management experience to his role as National VP of Operations. He currently oversees OpenWorks nationwide operations team, as well as managing the diverse facility services preferred partner network. Mary Tirado joined OpenWorks in 2015 and brings 12 years of experience in the janitorial industry in her current role as regional operations manager for the Phoenix region. She focuses on developing franchise partners within the region and maintaining high quality service levels in various industries. She holds industry certifications in infection control, OSHA safety, and bloodborne pathogens. Matthew Borkowski is the chemical specialist for Waxy, Arizona. He's enjoyed 15, or 12 years with the company and nearly 20 years in various aspects of the cleaning industry. As a product specialist, he strives to be a trusted advisor, offering reliable advice and guidance on best chemicals, equipment, and tools for a given job. Today's learning objectives include understanding various equipment and technology currently available for workplace disinfectants and how effective it is for removing coronavirus and other pathogens. Review the equipment and technology used by OpenWorks for workplace disinfectants and why it's utilized. Appreciate the importance of applying the right equipment and products for specific environments to achieve maximum efficiency. And perceive the necessaries necessities of deep cleaning and disinfectants to remove coronavirus in work communities and public environments. Before we get started today, I'd like to cover a few details about the event. A live question and answer session will follow today's presentation. And to submit your questions, please navigate to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. Our presenters will answer as many questions as time permits. Following today's webcast, you'll receive a PDF copy of the slides used today. You'll receive a link to a brief online assessment as well, and upon successful completion, you'll receive a CEU certification. Today's webcast will also be archived at facilitiesnet.com slash webcast. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Amy, if you go to the agenda. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, deep cleaning and disinfection to remove coronavirus and other infectious, infectious diseases has become critical in providing a safe and healthy environment for employees, customers, and vendors. The commercial cleaning industry has seen a recent influx of new products and technology touting the ability to destroy the coronavirus. The virus that causes COVID-19 can be killed by using the correct disinfectants and applications. It is vitally important to understand which of the many products available are effective at killing the coronavirus and the environments in which they are best utilized. During the presentation today, OpenWorks team members uh, and our WAXI co-host will discuss the various equipment and technologies available for workplace disinfection and how effective they are for removing coronavirus and other pathogens. We'll discuss the importance of applying the right equipment and products to specific environments to achieve maximum efficacy, and the necessity of deep cleaning and disinfection to remove coronavirus in work, community, and public environments. Next slide, please. One key factor that we've all become keenly aware of during this novel coronavirus pandemic is that many people may not completely understand the difference between cleaning and disinfection. For the purposes of this presentation, we'll quickly review them. Cleaning is the physical action of removing dust, dirt, and debris. Regular cleaning tasks include sweeping, vacuuming, dusting, and mopping. Disinfecting means you're applying a disinfecting product, usually chemicals, that must kill at least 99.999% of the bacteria and viruses on a surface. Surfaces usually need to remain wet longer, which is referred to as dwell time, 
and dwell time for disinfection products can range from one to 10 minutes. It is important to remember that a clean surface may not be disinfected and conversely, a disinfected surface may not be clean. If a surface is visibly dirty, a disinfected product will be much less effective. Any visible soil must be removed before disinfecting to allow the disinfectant to reach the bacteria or surface or virus on the surface when it is applied. To ensure the best results when disinfecting, your service provider should use a two-step process at a minimum. Step one is to perform general cleaning to remove soil, dirt, dust, and debris, organic, mat organic matter, and most germs. During the second step, approve disinfectants, and disinfectants such as EPA list and antimicrobial disinfectants are used to destroy germs. Next slide, please. The Center for Disease Control provides excellent guidance for those seeking information on disinfectant in their workplace, businesses, schools, and homes, and regularly updates their website with relevant content. This three-step process listed here can assist you in developing, implementing, and maintaining or revising your individual plans as needed. You can find this information at www.coronavirus.gov. Next slide, please. It's also important to note that the coronavirus can remain active on some surfaces for as long as seven days. This chart shows the lifespan on surfaces commonly found in a workplace. As you can see from this chart, the type of surfaces vary greatly from soft surfaces such as paper to, to solid surfaces such as stainless steel. Significant differences exist from one surface to the next, and this variation is viral lifespan, uh, this vir uh, variation in viral lifespan is another reason to ensure you're using the proper equipment and chemicals when disinfecting any environment. Next slide. Before we dive in, uh, I'm going to transition at this time over to Mary Tirado, who's going to discuss equipment and what's available in the marketplace. Mary? Thank you, Anthony. Yes, we're going to be discussing different items used in today's world. Um, one of them right now is um, air purifiers and ozone generators. EPA does not certify air cleaning devices. They state that when used properly, air purifiers with HEPA filtration can help reduce airborne contaminants, including viruses in environment or confined space. However, by itself, a portable air cleaner is not enough to protect people from COVID-19. When used along with other best practices recommended by CDC, operating an air cleaner can be a useful part of a more comprehensive COVID-19 protection plan. Also worth noting that air purifier developers are not allowed to market their devices as health products in the United States because their benefits aren't straightforward. This product is best used to provide and enhance air quality for your employees. It is not recommended to replace disinfection for the workplace environment. If we could go to the next slide, please. Steam cleaners. Um, steam cleaners are, have been proven effective in killing past viruses, particularly in areas where you may not be able to use detergents such as soft furnishings. The government advices on cleaning COVID-19 says when it can, items cannot be cleaned using detergent or laundered, for example, upholstered furniture and mattresses, steam cleaning may be used. Steam can be used on surfaces like laminate floors, tiles, grout, sealed worktops, sinks, baths, and glass. You can also use steam on carpets and upholstery. However, these are variables with steam cleaning. Sometimes it is not effective because of the fact that steam must be used close to the surface that's being cleaned. The right amount of time to be effectively um, killed germs is dependent on the temperature of the steam that you're using. Steam cleaning should be avoided on any surface that can be damaged by water or heat, such as painted surfaces, delicate fabrics, porous surfaces like brick or marble, Steam cleaning can also damage the surface protection on wooden floors, causing water to enter the wood and make it expand. Because of those factors, steam is not the most effective way to disinfect the surface. Instead, best practices recommend that once the carpet, fabric, or seating has been thoroughly cleaned using the commercial grade cleaner, the process should be repeated using a disinfectant cleaner that's allowed to set at least 10 minutes 
before wiping or extracting. Alternately, once cleaning has been performed, carpet, fabric, and seating can be sprayed with an approved disinfectant via electrostatic spraying or a fogger. Um, next slide, please. Ultraviolet light technology. The use of ultraviolet light for disinfection has been around for something like a century and is today a long established method used frequently in hospitals and medical settings to sterilize rooms and equipment. But it also can be a useful tool for disinfecting workplace and high traffic common areas. The use short wavelength of ultraviolet light or UVC light as it's commonly known is to disinfect another technologies using a multi-barrier approach to ensure that whatever pathogens is not killed by one method, say filtering or cleaning, it inactivated by another UVC. And this way UVC could be installed now in clinical or other settings to augment existing processes or shore up existing protocols that they're exhausted by excessive demand due to the pandemic. One of the things is that UVC light causes DNA either to change form or act like a molecule scissor causing nicks and cuts in the genetic material and rendering the virus inactive. Because the UVC light can cause sunburn and the cell mutations that lead to skin cancer, the most machines currently in use can only work safely and effective in empty rooms making them impractical for use in high traffic areas like waiting rooms and other common spaces where people gather. Most commonly, this is used in isolation rooms in hospitals after patient discharge. For example, with a patient that has tuberculosis that was placed in an isolation room, they would need a three-step process to decontaminate the room. The UVC light is brought in to degrade the microbes or viruses to stop the spread by making it unable to reproduce. However, the traditional cleaning method is still used after the UVA UVC light has been used in the room. And so that, why, that is why most often the light technology is great in formats where a room is empty, but it's not great for where there are people gathering in an area. Next slide, please. Robotics. Robotics have been long been used in industrial and manufacturing settings. And hazardous duty robots have been around the military for decades, but the arrival of COVID-19 has increased demand for service robotics to perform tasks that have traditionally been handled by humans, particularly for cleaning and disinfection. UV light zapping dermicidal robots and robots that spray disinfectant are being used in various different sectors of public environments, from hospitals to hotels. A leading provider has shipped hundreds of their bots around the world, including nearly Veterans Administration Hospital sites run by the U.S. Department of Defense and various hotels and healthcare facilities. This is definitely an emerging market segment for disinfection equipment, so it will definitely be interesting to see the innovative um, technology that arises from the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Surface residual products. We know that the coronavirus can live on surfaces as like silicon rubber for up to three days and for at least five days on ceramic tile, glass, and stainless steel. Surface residual products are coating that are applied after deep cleaning and disinfection, typically by spraying and then allowed to dry without wiping off. The coating are chemically engineered to inhibit the growth and spread of viruses for extended periods of time, from 24 days to 30 days or longer. Once applied or disinfected surface is allowed to dry, the solution creates a covalent bond that's a unique spike structure and a positive, positive electrical charge. On contact, the spikes punch through the cell walls of the microbes. Currently, EPA registered products that claim long-lasting effectiveness are limited to those that control odor-causing bacteria on hard, non-porous surfaces. At this time, there are no EPA registered products that claim long lasting disinfection. EPA researchers hope to determine whether antimicrobial products can provide residual disinfection on surfaces over time and how durable those disinfection abilities of the product in normal use, including routine cleaning and natural weathering. If a surface residual product has an EPA uh, approved, it will have a registered number that is listed on its labeling and found on EPA's list. This is an emerging technology in the area of disinfection that OpenWorks is closely following for industry and product developments. 
Now I'll hand it back to Anthony to give you some quick insight in the equipment OpenWorks uses to deep clean and disinfect. Anthony? Thanks, Mary. Great information. Environmental Protection Agency researchers evaluate many alternative methods to disinfect for COVID-19, like ultraviolet light, UV, ozone, and steam, for use in areas such as public transit systems to keep trains, buses, and facilities clean and safe for passengers. In addition, the EPA has found disinfectant application methods such as electrostatic sprayers or foggers to produce promising results. Let's talk about the equipment that we here at OpenWorks regularly use for disinfection and deep cleaning. Next slide, please. Electrostatic disinfection provides a broad spectrum approach to disinfecting a complete surface area and an entire room. They do not provide mechanical cleaning action, meaning they do not remove physical soil, but rather disinfect mechanically pre-cleaned surfaces. Electrostatic sprayers provide a positively charged spray as it exits the nozzle. The electromagnetically charged, electromagnetically charged spray sticks to the targeted surface, providing more even and thorough 360 degree coverage. Some of the benefits of this process are a 50% reduction in application time as compared to conventional methods. Cost efficiency in disinfected product application and usage. It helps avoid liquid pooling when it's often associated with trigger sprayers. And it allows computer equipment such as keyboards, monitors, and desktops and laptop encasements to be treated as they can be lightly, lightly misted without damage if used correctly. It's important to note that the EPA considers electrostatic sprayers as low pressure sprayer. Any disinfectant labels that include the language low pressure sprayer or low pressure coarse sprayer indicate that the product can be used through an electrostatic sprayer. Next slide, please. Foggers and misters are also equipment that offer a rapid and efficient process. Foggers emit a fog or mist that consists of tiny droplets of disinfectant particles, so small that they remain suspended in the air long enough to kill airborne viruses and bacteria. The disinfectant also eliminates pathogens on surfaces, including ceilings, walls, and furniture and floors. An advantage with fogging is that the disinfectant reaches areas that may be difficult to clean. The fog reaches into areas that may be hard to reach with traditional cleaning. In most cases, it's not necessary to move equipment or furniture around before or during the cleaning process. Additionally, droplet size can be adjusted from fine to heavy. In addition, particles emitted in the fog or mist are so small and fine they evaporate quickly and typically don't require wipe down. However, depending on the sensitivity of the surface you're cleaning, you may still want to wipe down the surface after the dwell time elapses. If not saturated by the fog application, paperwork can be exposed to fogging or misting. The best practice is to dispose of paperwork, paperwork if the risk of contamination exists or during the cleaning process. The EPA refers to fogging as fumigation and wide area spraying. Any EPA approved disinfected product indicated for use in fumigation can likely be used in a fogger. If uncertain, contact the product's manufacturer. At this time, I'm gonna pass things off to Matthew Borkowski, the chemical specialist from Waxy Sanitary. Matthew? Great, thank you, Anthony. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about disinfectants um, and I have a few points here. The EPA's role concerning disinfectants, uh, the pesticide product label system put in place by the EPA, uh, emerging viral pathogen guidance also by the EPA, and a little bit on choosing a disinfectant and some additional resources that you might want to look into. Um, so I work for a, I work for a Janssen distributor and any disinfectant that we sell is EPA registered. Uh, I assume, well, the same should be true of your distributor as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So why is the EPA involved? What is their role concerning disinfectant? Uh, we have up on the screen, this is, uh, this is the EPA's webpage. Hopefully you're familiar with it. This webpage has been a great resource for me uh, as well as the CDC. Um, so why is the EPA involved? That can be traced all the way back to 1910 
when Congress passed the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act. Uh, so yes, it goes back to 1910. It was a sort of consumer protection act to ensure that products that you were buying actually did what the label said it was going to do. So this act, this uh, abbreviated FIFRA, this act was handed over to the EPA in the early 1970s for administration and regulation. And from what I can tell, uh, they've done an excellent job with it. So the EPA ensures that number one, a product is tested and proven to work. Number two, information about a product is publicly available. And number three, uh, they can assure consumer safety and environmental safety. Uh, the burden of providing information and proving claims is mostly put upon the chemical manufacturer or the chemical formulator. After the manufacturer and the EPA have done extensive research and testing on a particular pesticide, uh, it is assigned a registration number, meaning that it is okay for the EPA to market this product in the United States. The, by the way, the disinfectants that we use are considered by the EPA to be pesticides in that they kill, destroy, uh, or inactivate a target. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, here we have one of Waxy's newer products. It's an HP disinfectant cleaner. Um, in the course of the extensive research and testing done by the formulator and the EPA, a master label is developed. This master label tells us the conditions, directions, and precautions that define who may use a pesticide, as well as where, how, how much, and how often it may be used. You'll notice on each label the phrase, it is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. So in other words, that means the label is the law, please follow those directions on the label and don't deviate, don't make any assumptions. Concerning the disinfectants that we use, the master label also tells us things like active ingredients, pathogen kill claims, and dilution and contact time. There is an enormous cost to developing and registering a disinfectant formula. Uh, therefore, these formulas are shared. Um, so if you'll, if you'll look at the screen, HP Disinfectant Cleaner, um, close to the bottom, there's a, there's a red oval, and that is circling the EPA registration number. Um, if, uh, if you're using a disinfectant, it should, have, it should have the EPA registration number on the label. That label is, uh, or that number is divided into, in this case, three sections, 45745-11-14994. Uh, so the first two, sections of numbers. Um, that is the formulator registration. So the original company that developed, that developed this, um, this formula, that is their registration number. The third section, 14994, that's a sub-registration. That's actually Waxy's sub-registration number. Uh, and that means that Waxy has invested in this particular formula and can market it under their own name. Uh, but if you go to the EPA's website and look up that registration number, uh, it will take you right to the original formulator's master label. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, EPA has something fairly new, and it's called List N. Uh, this is a list of disinfectants that are suitable for use against the, the new virus, SARS-CoV-2. So if you remember back, back to December, January, February, uh, we didn't really even have a name for this, uh, this new coronavirus. We were calling it the novel coronavirus, novel meaning new. Um, it was new, we didn't know much about it, and we're still learning about it. Uh, so because it was new, no disinfectant at the time had a specific kill claim for this virus, which we're now calling SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so if there is no disinfectant, effective against it, what do we do? Well, since this was declared a pandemic, the EPA opened up its emerging viral pathogen guidance. Uh, and what that means, uh, that means that we can make claims without having a specific kill claim on the label for SARS-CoV-2. 
And to go about doing that, first we need to identify this emerging virus type, see what type of virus it is. Then we need to go to our master label and identify types of viruses that are claimed you know, to be able to kill on that label. Uh, and then following that, the EPA gives us sort of a, a hierarchy or a word problem to follow uh, that might say, you know, hey, this new virus is, uh, is an, an developed virus. And on your master label, you have these enveloped viruses. So if you can kill these viruses, then we can assume, uh, you know, that you can kill the, the emerging virus. Uh, so we don't really specifically say, hey, this disinfectant kills SARS-CoV-2. The wording is a little more complicated. We would say something like, under the EPA's emerging viral pathogen guidelines, this disinfectant is suitable for you. Matthew, I think we lost your audio. I don't know if you froze or what's going on. I'm going to forward on to the next um, slide, Anthony, if you don't mind picking sure, up. Sure, go ahead. There we go. Sorry about that, everybody. Technology. Looks like, looks like Matthew just came back in. So oh, Matthew, Matthew, are you back? Uh, yes, I'm back. Sorry. Where did we? Oh, uh, that's where okay. Let me take you back a slide. <laughs> okay. All right. There you go. Is that? Okay. Am I in the right spot? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the slide I want. Uh, so basically, if we have in our hands our favorite disinfectant, and we want to see if it's suitable for use against SARS-CoV-2, you should be able to easily find on that disinfectant label the EPA registration number. So take the first two sections and type it into that tool, hit enter, and if nothing comes up, then that means that your particular disinfectant is not suitable. Uh, but if, it, if something does come up, you'll see down the bottom, it gives you the EPA registration number, the active ingredients, the product name, the company that makes it, uh, which directions should you follow. Uh, in this case, it looks like it's the human coronavirus directions, uh, which tells us we need a dilution of you know, whatever it should be and a contact time of five minutes. Uh, and of course, all of the claims have to do with hard, non-porous surfaces. That's how disinfectants are tested. It's extremely difficult to test in the air or on a fabric or something like that. Uh, so basically, this is easy to get to. If you go to epa.gov, start scrolling around a little bit, I see they've given us the, uh, the web address right there, but it's fairly easy to get to and you can check your favorite disinfectants. Um, okay, we'll, we'll stay on this slide. I just have a, a few closing things uh, about choosing a disinfectant. Um, what factors should we think about when choosing a disinfectant? I would say the first one would be specific kill claims. Uh, for example, if we have a norovirus outbreak in a facility, we definitely want to make sure our disinfectant has a kill claim against the norovirus. Uh, the next thing we might look at is dilution and contact time. Um, how long does this disinfectant need to remain on the surface to ensure that it will kill that 99.99% to specific pathogens. Uh, another aspect is user safety and occupant safety. Uh, you know, we certainly want the people spraying or applying the disinfectants to be safe. Uh, and then uh, we want our occupants of the building to be safe as well. Uh, another thing is surface compatibility. Uh, is our disinfectant compatible with the different surfaces that we have in our facility? For example, if we have a lot of marble countertops, we may want to avoid uh, something acidic, like sometimes hydrogen peroxide disinfectants are, because that could, over time, etch a countertop. So surface compatibility is certainly a factor. Uh, and then um, going on from there, cost is a factor, fragrance may be a factor, um, and at this point, availability certainly is a factor. Uh, I already mentioned oh, a couple of my favorite resources for learning about COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 are the EPA and the CDC. Um, they've, in, they've distilled an incredible amount of information for us uh, and put it into a, a fairly neat little package. 
Um, I, I know you turn on the news, turn on the TV, the radio, and there's just so much information flying around. I trust the EPA and the C CDC to have distilled this information into something palatable for us. Also, uh, both of these websites, the EPA and the CDC, got together and provided some, some joint guidance. So there's two PDF documents that you'll be able to, to find, joint guidance for reopening your facility. It's well worth the read, and if you do read the entire thing, I think it will put your mind at ease a little bit. I think there's a lot of panic going on out there, a lot of it unnecessary. So read that joint guidance from the EPA and the CDC. Uh, also, my company, Waxy, if you go to info.waxy.com, uh, we also have lots of information. Uh, and we have something we're calling RE6, which is six steps for reopening your facility. So info.waxy.com, take a look. So at this point, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Anthony. Thanks, Matthew. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, OpenWorks. With more than 35 years of experience, OpenWorks is proud to continue to provide our nearly 4,500 nationwide customers with the most effective and innovative processes in the cleaning industry, along with a highly trained elite network of service providers using the latest cleaning technologies and best practices. Next slide, please. So what are some of the advantages if you partner with OpenWorks? First, our elite service provider network brings together business owners dedicated to mutual success through seamless, high value, high value facilities care. We have an industry leading customer retention rate at over 98%, which is 43% higher than the industry average. We use only EPA approved broad spectrum hard surface disinfectants, which have been shown to be effective against similar viruses to COVID-19. We're certified by the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council, a division of the ISSA, the Worldwide Cleaning Industry Association, on how to prepare for, respond to, and recover from biohazards in the workplace with a specific fo focus on COVID-19. We're trained on infection and contamination control measures for infectious disease outbreak situations, such as the novel coronavirus. OpenWorks can become your one-stop shop for integrated facility services. We can become your one-stop shop for integrated facility services provision. We provide our customers with unique customer experience through providing a single point of communication, local service with corporate oversight, and high quality and responsive service providers. In short, a cleaner, safer, and healthier environment, environment means a more productive workplace in the face of a viral pandemic and beyond. Next slide, please. We recently created a new service offering for our customers called TotalWorks. TotalWorks is a complete cleaning and disinfection system that includes treatment of all high touch surfaces throughout your facility. It includes two key programs, Sani Services and InfectaGuard. Next slide, please. The SANI services is comprised of three main service offerings, SANI Care, SANI Works, and SANI Tech. SANI Care is our base level of services and includes cleaning and disinfection of high touch surface areas. SANI Works is a more detailed and more frequent level of cleaning and disinfection. And SANI Tech encompasses all services with a dedicated team member who is specifically assigned to cleaning and disinfection duties typically done multiple times during the day. Next slide, please. InfectaGuard is a one-time in-depth cleaning and disinfection service that gives you the peace of mind that your facility has been disinfected. Utilizing EPA-approved antimicrobial disinfectants, this treatment prevents the spread of germs that cause infections, such as influenza and COVID-19. If you have a confirmed case of COVID-19 or another biohazard or virus outbreak and need to ensure your facility is completely disinfected, choose InfectaGuard Plus, which follows the Global Biorisk Advisory Council's six-step process to ensure your facility is thoroughly disinfected. Even hard to reach surfaces and surfaces that are typically not cleaned on a regular basis. Next slide, please. Here on this slide, you'll see a list of website locations with a variety of information 
about how to disinfect your work environment for COVID-19. Last slide. We really appreciate your participation in today's webinar. If you'd like to learn more about our products or services, you can locate that at www.openworksweb.com. We're here to answer your questions for the remainder of the webinar. Just type them in the chat window and we'll address them. Thank you all so much. I do have several questions that I'm gonna um, go through and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have left. Um, first off, I think this would be a good question for Matthew. Matthew, do all list end products have the 99.999% claim? Uh, yes, they should if, if they've made it to list N. And I don't know how, how many nines out that goes. Uh, but if it made it to list N, then yes, it should be that 99.99, etc. Yes. Got you. Okay, thank you so much. And on the same, in, we're still talking about disinfectant products here, Matthew. Um, what log kill is the hydrogen peroxide product? Right. I saw that question, and I'm not at all prepared to answer that. Uh, that's, that's that's certainly it. not something that's going to be on the master label. I I could I could look into it and ask the manufacturer. Uh, there are many different HP formulas, so I would imagine that different differs from formula to formula. So I would say uh, to get that info, I would ask the manufacturer of your specific disinfectant. Good, thank you so much. Um, let's see. Have, has OpenWorks been tasked with, um, this is a good question for Anthony. Um, has OpenWorks been tasked, tasked with cleaning any environment, environments like schools or public buildings? Uh, yeah, I actually typed an answer in there for uh, the person. I think that's a great question. Oh, cool. We are working with several um, school districts, public and private, as well as universities and colleges that we already provide service to, to assist them with their reopening plans. Depending on whether they are public or private really drives their ability to reopen. Many of the public schools are obviously controlled by government regulations and don't have reopening plans, but wish to reopen. Um, those that are open, we also service facilities like daycares. Many of them have chosen our InfectiGuard Plus product, um, which again follows that um, GBAC six step process um, that prepares the facility by both cleaning and disinfecting for their students, staff, and faculty to, to return in the fall. Um, thank you so much. Um, someone asked that they noticed on the comparison chart, we didn't really spend a lot of time on that. Um, they're, they're asking if we, do we conduct disinfection of internal duct work um, as an HVAC duct work? Um, Anthony, do you wanna, or Mary, either one of you wanna address that? Yeah, I, I, I can take that. Um, foggers and misters uh, previously existed uh, in the uh, HVAC industry to do that. So they were applying disinfectant to the inside uh, of ductwork using foggers. So that, that's an existing technology that's already used in those areas and, and is very effective. Great, thank you. Um, Matthew, can you give us some, some insight? It, we used the product label um, for the HP disinfectant on the slide, and someone is wondering if that's actually an effective product for the electrostatic sprayer. Um, do you have any insight into that? Uh, I, I do. Uh, the, the, the electrostatic sprayers that we sell are paired with a specific chemical. So, so we sort of sell a package or a system, and what we're spraying through our electrostatic sprayers is a chemical called NADCC. Uh, and basically that, uh, that disinfects by using chlorine. Uh, within our system, if we were to use anything else through that sprayer, uh, it, it, would, it would void the warranty. I, I have very little experience spraying anything else through the electrostatic sprayer except for NADCC. Um, I, I, don't see, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Uh, I, I would just have to check the, uh, the master label 
to make sure that it says, uh, you know, that that product is okay for spraying. Uh, as far as electrostatic goes, the EPA is, is still sort of studying that, uh, the electrostatic effect on chemicals, if any at all. Great, thank you. And, and obviously, uh, as you said earlier, the, your, your, best, um, your best information is going to come from the, the equipment manufacturer or the, the chemical product manufacturer. If you have any questions, that's always a good default. Um, Anthony or Mary, what product do we have for high touch areas for cleaning high touch areas and um, can it be used by untrained staff and would have to be a fresh water wipe down? You wanna yes. take that, Mary? Yes, I'll take that. Um, so there are various chemicals on the list that can be used for disinfection. Um, typically, I do not recommend individuals that are not trained on chemical usage to use it. Um, there are def, um, different um, items that should be reviewed with the employee who's going to be using the chemical. Um, so I would go back to the um, SDS sheet um, to review with your employee that's going to be using the chemicals. Um, there are various different lists of chemicals that can be used to disinfect. Um, but I do recommend that you do um, have whoever is using, I cannot stress that enough, that whoever is using the product should be trained on how to use it properly, ensure there's labeling, and the SDS sheets are used. Um, common um, products that are used in the industry um, are alpha. Um, we use um, Oxiver. We use um, the tablets that are used in, in the electrostatic sprayers. So there are various um, chemicals. Um, you can go online and they will show you, um, as Matt was talking about, the, the registered products that are good for disinfection. There are many on there. So please take a look online and see which products um, you would like to use. And um, once you do have them um, to use, um, I cannot stress enough again, please ensure that you're reading the SDS sheet to ensure proper usage. Thank you. Uh, Mary, this may be one that you can take, if not uh, Anthony. What type of testing or verification does OpenWorks use to show that we're effectively dis in disinfecting surfaces? So we work with the manufacturers. Um, Waxy, as an example, provide us with white paper studies and testing on the products that we utilize. So we rely on our manufacturers to provide us with that information. Um, but these products that we use are EPA registered um, and EPA also provides information on the products in terms of efficacy claims and manufacturer and links to the manufacturer's product information. Awesome. Eddie, I think this would be good for you to address also. What are the best practices to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace? Are walk-off mats with footwells that contain a disinfectant with 70% alcohol effective? I would say the number one um, the, the number one thing you can do in the workplace is to uh, wear a mask. So right now during the virus uh, being readily transmitted in workplaces is to wear a mask and prevent the spread, uh, maintain physical distancing. In terms of chemicals, washing your hands is an incredibly effective method of not um, moving the virus around the facility regular cleaning and disinfection, uh, hand sanitizers. Those are the types of things that you should be doing in your workplace. But certainly regular disinfection and cleaning is an integral part of ensuring that your employees and customers are kept safe. Wonderful, thank you. This is an, another interesting question, Anthony, that you may be able to address. Have you experienced any pandemic related supply chain issues for your chemical disinfectant products. I'm assuming everybody's experienced, you know, the difficulty in finding white type products that may be what's what they're referring to. Yeah, we, we have not. Thankfully, we have great relationships with, with our providers such as Waxy that have massive amounts of available chemicals. Um, we've also worked with, with some emerging technologies for different types of disinfection, some of which have claims of up to 90 days of disinfection for products. Um, so we're continually looking at, at our options and making sure that our customers have disinfectant products and our service providers have those same products. Thank you. Mary, here's one. 
Can I use a fogger or mister in a highly trafficked area, such as a high rise condominium? Um, we want the tenants reassured that it's a good safety measure. Um, absolutely, yes. We definitely use um, the product that we use um, in um, the electrostatic sprayer is safe for round individuals. However, um, for the sake of ensuring that the surfaces are saturated and the dwell time is there, we always want to recommend that um, individuals are not present when the spraying or fogging is being conducted. Um, fogging is a different method, you, you know, definitely takes um, a different dwell time than like electrostatic sprayer. So while it's safe enough for individuals to be in the environment after the fact, um, we definitely do not recommend that individuals are present within the vicinity of that being um, discharged and that chemical being placed on the surfaces. Thank you. Um, so do we have any thoughts or insights we'd like to share on the antimicrobial treatment coatings? We did address the surface residual products a little bit. Um, Anthony, do you have anything you, you would like to add as far as you know us watching that as an emerging technology. This says, um, their claims that the effects are long lasting days to weeks. Has EPA or CDC supported or approved these types of treatments for COVID-19? Yeah, CDC doesn't, uh, they don't approve, the EPA approves chemicals and, and to become an EPA approved chemical doesn't necessarily validate the claims of the manufacturer. Uh, so the manufacturers are required to provide that information. So there are EPA approved chemicals with efficacy claims that go out um, that are long lasting. Uh, we're, we are working with some manufacturers of those um, and you would need to refer to their product claims and white papers to determine whether those, those would be effective applications for you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, just a second here is there Ma Matthew is there a product where the label says specifically for use in electrostatic sprayers no no not yet uh, okay. in fact the the EPA is is still studying that um, electrostatic for disinfection uh, it's been around for I guess two or three years now uh, but obviously it's become hugely popular recently and the EPA has recognized this and they are currently studying it, so stay tuned to their website. Wonderful, thank you. And we've had a couple of questions about the use of the antimicrobial mats that were mentioned in an earlier question. Has anybody had any experience or um, um, feedback on the effectiveness of the antimicrobial mats? I can answer that. Um, so the mats are typically used on um, clean room environments. Um, it's meant to um, keep the area clean of contaminants um, being spread through walking into um, the facility. But um, also keep in mind that, as Anthony was saying, mask and washing your hands is still needs to be used as a preventative measure because although um, we eliminate um, the, the items, the contaminants from us walking in from the soils from our shoes, we are not, um, it, that's not preventing the droplets from someone coughing or touching a surfaces in a facility. Wonderful, thank you. Um, here's an interesting question that, uh, this may be something from, from Mary or Matthew, because of possible chemical interactions with materials inside research teaching labs, what type of disinfection would be recommended? Well, I guess, you know, the first thing we would need to do or you would need to do uh, is identify the materials that, that you th think might not be compatible with a disinfectant uh, and then check your favorite disinfectant and some others. Check the master label to see if there are any incompatibilities. Uh, I, I would guess the safest bet would be to choose a disinfectant cleaner that has a neutral or near neutral pH. Thank you. And while I've got your attention, what are the environmental effects of the long lasting disinfectants? So the surface residual products, I'm not sure we know, but you may have more insight than I do. Yeah, that, that's uh, sort of a new topic to me. I, I really haven't got into it too much. 
uh, you know, especially talking about environmental hazards down the road. I, I'm not sure I can answer that. And I'm not sure that they've done enough testing with the EPA yet. That may be one of the things that they're evaluating through the, the testing process as nothing's been approved yet. So I would say that's probably an area to keep an eye on what's going on. Right, there are very, very few disinfectants that have any kind of residual clean. Most disinfectants are just here and now. You know, I've, I've sprayed it, I've given it dwell time. Uh, so here and now, I've disinfected that surface. Uh, you know, once it's wiped dry, I, I tell people biology never stops. Uh, so the next time somebody walks into that room, there's a possibility of, of contamination again. Um, and that, that's a good lead into to this question. Um, um, Anthony, I think this would be good for you. Should we confirm with our building engineers that our internal workspaces are being disinfected on a daily basis and, and what is being used? I know that's a concern for many people in the workplace right now. Yes, we, we would definitely recommend that not only um, business owners, uh, managers, and general managers and building managers should be aware, but we recommend that your tenants and employees are also aware. That way you can um, differentiate between what's expected of employees in terms of their personal workspace and disinfection and what's being provided to them on a nightly or periodic basis by the cleaning company that's doing the work. Uh, OpenWorks provides certificates to our, our uh, customers that provide a visual reference as to when the facility was disinfected, how often we clean, and what type of disinfection we do. And those are available through our Sani services and InfectaGuard services. Wonderful. Anthony, this may be one you can address as well. Um, this person has read the CIRC guidance document and, and other information, and they, they both mentioned that certain application methods are still under research by the EPA and the CDC. Um, for example, um, EPA believes that fogging misting may not be adequately effective. Is this true or accurate? Um, I'm sure that Anthony can address that in a little more detail. Because it's a product yeah. regularly. I, I, I wouldn't comment to the, to the accuracy or truthfulness of the statement. What I would say is that um, the types of method that you apply chemicals is less, is less important than the chemical you are using um, and using the chemical correctly. Uh, you can use the perfect chemical. If you don't use the correct application method, the chemical becomes um, ineffective. Uh, if, you don't correct, if you don't have enough coverage, uh, if you don't allow for the dwell time, those are the most important things, Less, much, much more important than the actual application method. So certainly they are still evaluating foggers, misters, and electrostatic sprayers, um, but if you're using the device correctly and meeting the manufacturer, the chemical manufacturing requirements, um, for example, droplet size and things like this and coverage and dwell time, um, the, the, the application should be effective. But yes, the EPA is still evaluating the methodologies. But many of the manufacturers of products will give you direction on whether or not the product can be sprayed through a fogger or mister. And we really recommend that before you do any application, you understand how the chemical can be used, whether it can be used in a fogger. And the manufacturer may provide guidance around how to use it, what type of fogger, mister, or electric static sprayer you should use. Um, things like droplet size, uh, that will tell you what type of sprayer and, and if you can use it in a sprayer or not. Thank you. This is an interesting question that uh, we've not had before. When we disinfect, are we killing the good bacteria also? Uh, yeah, yeah, you absolutely are. Um, and to find out for sure, we need to know in the specific name of that bacteria and then we can check the master label but if you're disinfecting uh you're killing you know you're killing everything that it claims to kill so if there is you know good bacteria whatever that means we would be killing that as well yes great thank you um anthony what is the recommended or adequate time frame to reopen um after you've had to reopen a reported infected area after um, a disinfection has been completed so obviously if a, if a covid case has been reported and they've disinfected how long should they wait 
Um, once, this, once the area has been completely disinfected, it's free and clear of the virus and people could return to work the next day. Uh, an example, we have had co uh, positive cases in our building in the uh, corporate location. Um, we bring in disinfectant cleaning and electrostatic spraying that evening and the facility is clean the next day. Um, it's also important to remember that the, the CDC's guidelines are that if a facility, I believe it's 14 days, maybe Matt can correct me, but if a case occurred more than 14 days ago, you don't need to take any action. So if somebody was exposed and in the facility and 14 days has passed, there's no cleaning required. The virus shouldn't still be active on any surfaces. Um, but certainly once you perform that thorough disinfection uh, via spraying or another method, the surfaces should be free and clear of, of the virus and you should be able to return to work uh, immediately post. Awesome, thank you. Mary, what requests are you receiving more for, for the application of our products? Is it electrostatic print spraying for ducts or is it workplace, wide, workplace widespread application for disinfection? Yeah, so the ones that we're getting in consistently are widespread um, work environments, right? We first, um, do an analysis of where um, there would, was a possible case and the areas and so forth. And so after that, we do spray the entirety of the facility. Um, so that way we're ensuring that all touch point surfaces are being um, touched with the, the sprayer. And that way the, the entire facility is disinfected, not just one area where that individual was located. And that way we're eliminated other potential areas that were contaminated. Wonderful, thank you. Um, one more question. We've had a couple of questions here regarding um, public transport or fleet vehicles. Anthony, do you have any insight into what would be the, um, probably the preferred cleaning method for disinfecting um, public transport and or fleet vehicles? There's certainly multiple methods. Um, we have customers who have done electrostatic spraying in vehicles. We have customers who've used foggers and misters, although they tend to be a little too wet for the surface. And we have customers who are, who are simply using disinfectant and wiping down vehicles. So multiple methods um, and different levels of efficiency. You'd have to evaluate each of those depending on the application, the size of the vehicle, how many vehicles, et cetera. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna make this the last question if I have not addressed your question in the Q&A panel, if somebody on the team hasn't, we will put together a, a document to address all of the questions that we've received today. So please um, know that I will follow up. I'm, my name is Lee McKenney. I'm the marketing manager. We'll send out an email um, that contains answers to all of the questions that we've received today in the Q&A session. So I apologize if we haven't been able to get to all of them. But I think as the last question, we'll wrap up with this one, um, another one we have not had before. A new subject has come up concerning restrooms and flushing toilets, toilets and airborne related risk. Are there any products available to mitigate that risk? And I'll leave that up for the team if you wanna. Yeah, I, I, wanna I can that. answer that. You know, foggers, uh, because they do create a mist, are effective in killing uh, airborne bacteria. Great, thank you. Again, thank you everybody for your um, fantastic questions today. We will address all of them via email and um, please feel free to reach out to anybody um, at OpenWorks if you have any further questions. Um, the presentation PDF will be emailed to you by FacilitiesNet and we'll follow up with questions on uh, the answers to your Q&A uh, Q questions. We appreciate your, your um, attendance today. Everybody, thank you and have a great day. Thank you. This is Amy from FacilitiesNet and thank you again to Anthony and Mary and Matthew and Lee for providing great information. Again, you'll receive a copy of the slides and the presentation will be archived at facilitiesnet.com slash webcast. Thank you. <laughs>